Isaiah chapter 11, be reading verses 1 through 10. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. What a day that will be. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Title of the message tonight, Go With What You Know. Go with what you know. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for another time, another opportunity. Lord, may we never take it for granted. The privilege we have of gathering together with your people in your house. Be able to meet around your word. Dear God, thank you for that. We're a blessed people. Lord, you've blessed us so much that the danger is we just take it for granted. We just expect it. We want to return thanks tonight for all the many, many blessings, all the favor you bestow upon us. And so for this time, Lord, we'd ask that you'd meet with us, guide and direct in this study, that it would be profitable. Pray that you would use it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to one more time consider some aspects of the coming kingdom that are important for being able to understand your Bible, uh, particularly major sections of the Old Testament. Alva McLean writes, generally we may say that Old Testament prophecy of the future mediatorial kingdom of God begins with a few scattered references in the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, opens up clearly in the records of the historical kingdom, grows in volume and brilliance as the historical kingdom declines and comes to its close in Malachi. And so we want to consider uh, some of that tonight. After that, I want us to look uh, in subsequent messages at some of the kingdom uh, parables in order to finish out this series. Uh, if you do not understand the kingdom parables, you can very easily get messed up in regards to doctrine. Many people have. There are a lot of areas and a lot of ways to uh, go off the rails, so to speak, doctrinally. And admittedly, in a lot of ways, it's easy to get confused in regards to a lot of aspects regarding the kingdom. Let me illustrate. If you look at Isaiah 61, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast them yourselves. And for your shame ye shall have double, for and, for, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. And then verse 11, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. 
As you go through that section of Isaiah, much in, in that section speaking about the coming kingdom, the next chapter continues on in the same vein. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as the lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all the kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. And thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. And Hephzibah, the word means, my delight is in her. And, and God expressing his delight in the land and in the people. And then, and Verse 5, he says, As the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. Give him no rest till he establish, till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies. And the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine for the which thou hast labored. But they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates. Prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway. Gather out the stones. Lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Then when you get to the next chapter, you read this. Who is this that cometh from Edom? With dyed garments from Basra. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in, in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, the year of my redeemed is come. And I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Now you're going back to the battle of Armageddon which precedes the millennium, but it gets even more confusing. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old. Moses and his people saying, where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? that led them by the hand, right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name, that led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble. So now we're all the way back to the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. You're reading along thinking that this is written in chronological order and that you're reading about the coming kingdom and, and all of a sudden you're at the Red Sea. And you start thinking, I, I must have missed something somewhere. Somewhere I, I missed a turn. I mentioned before until I understood a Filipino ways, I used to think a lot, of, a lot that way when I'm talking to them because, as some of you know, they don't have gender-specific pronouns. In fact, I guess they're ahead of their time. Their pronouns are transgender. No, just kidding. <laughs> but no offense, dear Filipino people. <laughs> um... But, but I, I would be talking to them and they would come up and they would say something like, Pastor, can you please pray for my nephew? He's having a really hard time right now and he's going through some difficult things. And, and then pretty soon in the conversation, they're saying, she just lost her job. And I'm thinking, oh, I thought they were talking about their nephew. I try to stay tuned in and, and, and get more clues. And, and it would go back and forth, he and she. And I thought, oh man, I don't have any idea who they're talking about now. And I, I'm not even sure who to pray for, you know. And, and so... Uh, 
but after a while, I just disregard the pronouns completely and just stay with the story and you'll be all right. But, uh, but you can feel that way sometimes with prophecy and, and, and kingdom passages. And, and again, McLean says, viewed from one standpoint, prophecy arises out of a definite historical situation immediately existing before the eyes of the prophet. There is, no, there is probably no exception to this rule. No matter how far into the future he was transported in vision, the prophet never lost his contact with history. And that's true. He never forgot where he was, nor the people to whom he was sent to speak on behalf of God. Although certain areas of the future are definitely clocked as to time sequence, and extent, we shall find in Old Testament prophecy no absolute, continuous, and unbroken chronology of the future. That's very true. And so it makes it sometimes very difficult to track along. It says the prophets often saw together on the screen of Revelation certain events which in their fulfillment would be greatly separated by centuries of time. This characteristic so strange to Western minds was in perfect harmony with the Oriental mind which was not greatly concerned with continuous chronology. And that's also very, very true. The Bible, humanly speaking, is an oriental book. The unyielding determination of numerous commentators to pour the events of Old Testament prophecy into a rigid mold of unbroken time has led to disastrous results. On the one hand, it has opened the way for the date setters with their endless and often curious attempts to articulate biblical predictions with historical events. But worse than that, it has led directly to a scheme of interpretations which is the main foundation of highly erroneous eschatological systems. And that is true. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, all millennial views and so on come out of, of, of misinterpretation, a misunderstanding of all of that. But our passage at hand uh, gets even more confusing. You go back to Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison that, to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, you can read that and follow along and, and feel like that's one event or, a, or maybe a series of closely interrelated events. You go to Luke chapter 4 and you read this. And he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And now, so Jesus walks into the synagogue. He's given the copy of the scroll of Isaiah. And he is going to stand up and read from Isaiah 61, the passage we just looked at. So he reads, he found the place where it's written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, we lose the impact of that, but that was a phenomenal statement. That was an earth-shaking statement. We read it and don't think much of it. But as they sat in the synagogue that day, I guarantee you there would have been people saying, wait a minute, wait, what's he saying here? An incredible statement that he makes. And, and all bear him witness and wondered and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. So they're going to wonder at the content of his message. They're going to wonder at the delivery and the ability he has to take the word of God and begin to speak it. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Wait a minute. Is not this Joseph's son? And, and, and he's claiming now uh, the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. And this is the carpenter. Uh, we, we know his father. Well, they didn't. They knew his uh, stepfather, if you will. 
but, but they're, they're shocked by this. He said unto them, ye will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent. Save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, and a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. So you have a very dramatic change here. They're shocked at first at what he's saying, the implications of what he's saying. They're wondering at the gracious words proceeding out of his mouth. And they're, they're listening attentively to this man that's come in and taken the scroll and, and read this passage, and then he begins to expand upon it. And, but now what he's saying has caused them to be filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him under the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. They were angry at him for bringing up something that was true but that they didn't like. Verse 26, unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, and a woman that was a widow. Unto none of them was Elijah sent except to this one. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian, Elisha. So he makes reference to both Elijah and Elisha, and they, those were two of their favorite prophets. So what's the, pro what's the problem here that they would be so filled, so incensed with wrath that they go from wondering at his gracious words and, and, and now they want to kill him? Well, the widow and the leper were both Gentiles. Both Gentiles. And so he's pointing out that two of their favorite prophets, the major miracles they did, the only beneficiaries were, were Gentiles. Well, Gentiles were heathen dogs. They didn't think the Gentiles were, were worthy of God's grace or blessings. And he's, he's going to correct their thinking in a, in a dramatic way. And that part of the story makes sense as it ties into the Old Testament. But here's the part that shows how challenging it can be with Old Testament prophecy. If you, if you look back at verse 19, he says, "...to preach the acceptable year of the Lord." And he closed the book, he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began to say, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now in the way that your Bible is laid out tonight, Jesus stops mid-verse, right, in the middle of the verse. Go back to Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And that seems to be one continuous thought. But as Jesus is reading along through that passage, he comes to the middle of the preceding verse, verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and he stops. Very important that he stops. And he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Because everything that came next was not being fulfilled. It was not. It would not be fulfilled in their generation. It would not be fulfilled at that time. In fact, it would not be fulfilled for another 2,000 years or so, give or take a few years. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. So in the middle of what we would look on as one continuous thought, he stops mid-section, mid-verse, and says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Nothing that came after that was. But we would read through it and just think we, we have one continuous narrative there, which we don't. There's a huge gap in time right there. And so as you're reading through your Bible, you can, go, you can cross over those gaps, sometimes without even realizing you are. The Old Testament prophets did not understand the gaps. 
And that's why it would say which, which mystery the, the prophets desired to look into. They did not understand. They did not understand, for instance, as we've said before, the church age. They didn't see that. They could see the mountains on the horizon as they prophesied of future events. They could see sometimes those events altogether. They could not see the gaps in between. They did not understand the church age. They did not understand that mystery. Paul came and proclaimed that mystery, and to him was given the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel was that Gentiles could come and be saved, that there was no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The Jew would have told you, hey, there's a great difference between the Jew and the Greek. We're God's people. They're not. And they're going to find out they're wrong. And so God, God was working in, in the Old Testament times. He was giving light as to what was coming in the future, but they missed a lot of that. They missed all of those valleys between the mountain peaks. And so in reading, sometimes we can do the exact same thing. And so when he comes to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, all of that was true. But the day of vengeance, Armageddon, of our God, no. To comfort all that mourned, the ultimate victory, the millennium, no. That hadn't come. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, no. That hasn't come yet. They're still mourning in Zion, if you will. The Jerusalem's still trodden down of the Gentiles. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, no. Hasn't come yet. That they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of our Lord, the Lord, that he might be glorified, no. And so on it goes when you're dealing with prophecy, when you're dealing with the millennium and so on. From the book, The Greatness of the Kingdom, sometimes prophecies of the kingdom have what has been called a double reference, but which might be more accurately called a telescopic character. And Kylan Dalich in his book has written, all prophecy is complex. That is, it sees together what history outrolls as separate. And all prophecy is a polytelismatic that's a good word for you. That is, it sees close behind the nearest coming epic-making turn in history, the summit of the end, but not always the valley, the canyon in between. In other words, somewhat as a picture lacks the dimension of depth, prophecy often lacks the dimension of time. Very important you understand that if you want to understand prophecy. Events appear together on the screen of prophecy, which in their fulfillment may be widely separated in time. Thus a student may find a prophecy having all the external marks of literary unity, just like we saw in Isaiah 61 there, yet referring to some event in the near future connected with the historical phase of the kingdom, and also to some far off event connected with the Messiah and his millennial kingdom. When the first event arrives, it becomes the earnest or the down payment as the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our salvation, the earnest and divine forecast of the more distant and final event. An excellent example may be, may be found in Isaiah 13, a prediction which begins with the defeat of Babylon by the Medes and moves from that point immediately to a Babylon of the end time. So it could be very, very confusing. We're talking about Babylon both times, but two completely different uh, eras in history. In the day when Israel is finally delivered from sorrow and fear and hard bondage. The first part of the prediction soon became a fact in ancient history, right after it was given there in Isaiah 13. The latter is even today a future event. The same phenomenon may be observed in prophecies of the coming of the mess messianic king, which the New Testament outrolls into two advents, greatly separated in time. Such a view of prophecy does not mean any abandonment of its literality. In other words, you can take it literally true. It's true. It's not, it's not picturesque, colorful language. It's literally true. Uh, the double prediction is literal, and it is to be literally fulfilled. The Medes have destroyed historic Babylon, and God will also literally destroy a future Babylon. Christ has come once, literally, and he will again break into the stream of history with no less literality. And so those peculiarities, and I don't mean that in a disparaging word, but those peculiarities of prophecy can make it very difficult to understand sometimes, and oftentimes people will jump to wrong conclusions without thoroughly studying those things out. Let me give you another example, Malachi chapter four. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, 
saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. In other words, well taken care of. The calves of the stall had a pretty good life until it came time for the banquet, but they had a good life until then. <laughs> ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. And so we start out here with Armageddon, and then we go to the millennium, and then we go back to Moses. As you continue on in the passage, he says, behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Okay, so at some point, before all of this, the end times, uh, Elijah has to come back. Well, how's that work in eschatology? How's that work in uh, uh, the timeline? Now, without Jesus' commentary on these verses we would not understand them. We would draw wrong conclusions. Come into the book of Matthew. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, John the Baptist, and if you will receive it, this is Elias, Elijah, which was for to come. He's referring to John the Baptist. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. The whole context, he's talking about John the Baptist. Verse 11, verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So this John the Baptist, he's the one that he's talking. He's talking about him. Verse, uh, Matthew 17, verse 9, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. His disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Or Elijah. They understood the passage. And they're saying, what, is, what does that mean? That Elijah has to first come. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already. Elijah's come already. And they knew him not. But have done unto him whatsoever they listed, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Now, without that, we'd have no idea. We'd be thinking, wow, I wonder where John, I wonder where John the Baptist fits in here, and I wonder how, how, or where Elijah fits in here, and when, when is he coming? Over in the book of Luke, the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, thy prayer is heard. Thy wife Elizabeth, this is before uh, John the Baptist was born, thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness. Many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John the Baptist was coming in the manner and the spirit, the power of Elijah. And so he is the one that fulfills in type the prophecy given in Malachi. But if we did not have the New Testament commentary on that, if we did not have Jesus' explanation, if we did not have the angel there speaking to Zacharias, he would be like, ah, I wonder when, when Elijah's coming. And Jesus would tell him, no, he's already come. And you say, well, that's confusing. And you know what? You're right. You're right. And don't get discouraged with that. Look at how often the disciples didn't get it, and they were with Jesus. I'd like to think if I had three and a half years to hang around Jesus, I, I, a lot of this would start making sense. But the disciples were with him day after day. In John chapter 2, then answered the Jews and said unto him, What signs showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, they don't understand. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years, was this temple and building, wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So when he says destroy this temple, they're standing right there. They naturally think he's talking about the temple they're in. He just overturned the money changer in the temple. The reason they're asking for a sign, they're basically saying, what, what, what authority do you have to come in here and just make havoc of this place? So they're 
They've just had a commotion. They've just had a big scene in the temple. They're standing there with the temple and that's what surrounds them and they want a sign. He says, destroy this temple. Well, what would you naturally think? The temple that he's just caused all this chaos in. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And so that's they, they just automatically, well, 40 and six years, it, it took 46 years to build. You're gonna rear it up in three days. And by the way, they would use this later in mocking him, thou that destroyest the temple and raises it up in three days. They're gonna mock him for this because they think literally that temple. But the Bible clearly tells us, but he spake of the temple of his body. And by the way, if you have friends that are Jehovah's Witnesses or they knock on your door, this is, this is a good passage to use with them because they do not believe that Jesus literally bodily rose from the dead. They have no answer for this passage. I've never had, I've, I've asked scores of Jehovah's Witnesses, dozens and dozens of them about this passage. And they look at it, they've never seen it before because they don't just study through their Bible, they study according to their Watchtower publications. And so they will, they'll look at it, they don't have any answer because they've been taught Jesus did not bodily resurrect from the grave. In fact, they will use when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples. See, they didn't even know who he was. But the Bible says very clearly their eyes were holden that they should not know him. So Jesus, they were kept from recognizing Jesus as they're walking on the road to Emmaus. And so they, they have no answer for this. And I shared in Sunday school this morning, when, uh, years ago I was talking to a Jehovah's Witness and I took him to this passage. He says, I, he says I, I'll, I'll, I'll look into that and I'll get an answer for you. I said, no, you won't. He said, what do you mean? I says, I've... I've probably shared that with 30 Jehovah's Witnesses and they all tell me they're going to give me an answer. They never do. They never come back. He says, well, maybe they consider you a lost cause. <laughs> and I said, I said, but, I said but, but do you have the right in your religion to just lie to people? Because that's a lie. If you tell me you're going to do something, you don't do it. He says, well, I'll try to get back to you. <laughs> and, he, and he never came back. Um, but look at the next verse. When therefore he was risen from the dead... His disciples remembered that he had said this unto them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So they didn't get it either, obviously. And then, and then when he was risen from the dead, oh, in three days the temple would be, oh, they got it later. Uh, Mark 9.30, they departed thence and passed through Galilee and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he, after that he's killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying. We're afraid to ask him. I, and that's, that's pretty clear. The son of man is delivered in the hands of men. They should kill him. And after that he's killed, he shall rise the third day. But they didn't even understand that because that wasn't on their radar screen. They were thinking he's coming to set up the kingdom. They, they didn't know there'd be a cross before the kingdom. And they didn't know there'd be a cross and then over 2,000 years, or 2,000 years approximately before the kingdom. And so they don't understand what he's talking about, but they're afraid to ask him. Either they're afraid that his response might be or, or they'll look dumb or whatever it might be. Uh, Mark 9, 16, verse nine. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that, that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, Believe not. Believe not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believe they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And so the disciples didn't get it. And there was a lot of things they didn't understand. There was a lot of things they didn't believe even when it had been told to them. And then in Luke 24, you have Jesus coming near unto the two on the road to Emmaus. We referred to that. Behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. That's why they didn't recognize him. And and he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Why, why are you sad? What are you guys talking about that's making you so sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast not known the things which are come to pass there in those days? I, do, you, do you not know what's happened in our city in the last three days? And he said unto them, what things? 
And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death. You don't know any of this stuff? And have crucified him? But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. They were thinking his redeeming, his redemption of Israel was to get them out from under the oppression. That's what their form of being redeemed was. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher, and when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? Not by their theological understanding. No, the Messiah was coming as the great conqueror. You see, what they would do is they would do what, what we can easily do as they go and they see those prophecies, those prophecies would culminate in a triumphant, hey, he's gonna come and rule with a rod of iron. He's gonna put all the nations down. He's gonna trod them underfoot. And so that's what they hung on to. The suffering servant, that, that didn't really fit into their theology. And so they'd kind of read through that and come to this triumphal reign of, of the Messiah. And he's saying, wait a minute. Ought not Christ to have suffered? Go back and read Isaiah 53 again. Now Christ has to suffer first. But they didn't get that. They didn't understand that. They were confused. Look at the next verse. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I'd pay a lot of money for that Bible college education. That's a phenomenal education right there to have the Lord Jesus Christ take you back through the Old Testament and point out that this is referring to me and this is referring to me and this is what this means. And, and he goes on with all of that. And then Jesus appears to the 11 and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. They'd been with him three and a half years and they missed it. So don't be discouraged or overwhelmed. You're in good company. 2 Timothy 2, 14 says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Steady to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's so easy to wrongly divide. Steady to rightly divide. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Look at what Peter wrote about Paul's writing, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking to them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. This is Peter. Peter, who had been with the Lord Jesus Christ. He'd had that education. He'd had his eyes opened. And he's writing about another divinely inspired writer. And he said, man, some of what Paul writes is hard to understand. So don't be discouraged, in which are some things hard to be understood. He says, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace. That's how Peter ends his second epistle. That's, that's the wonderful words from Peter. Because Peter, the three and a half years he was with Jesus, he didn't have any grace. He didn't know what grace was. He didn't know how to spell it. But God broke him. God humbled him. God restored him. And Peter understood grace. And then God could use him. And now as he closes out, we're hearing the last words from Peter. He says, hey, here's his very last verse, very last words of this man. 
before he's going to be crucified, but grow in grace, crucified upside down, historians tell us, grow in grace. In the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and ever. Amen. There are a lot of things about God that are too deep for us to understand. Romans eleven thirty three. 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. Isaiah 4, or Psalm 145, verse 3, his greatness is unsearchable. Isaiah 40, 28, there is no searching of his understanding. So what should our response be to all of that? First of all, humility. Humility. There's a lot we still don't know. There's a lot. Anybody comes along that claims to or acts like he knows it all, he doesn't. There's a lot we don't know. The Bible's a very deep book. So humility, patience and diligence in study, a teachable spirit, and then also this, and we'll close with this. Mark 16, 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them that had seen him after he was risen. And so they, they still haven't gotten things right. They're still kind of messed up with things. And the next verse, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 24, where they were struggling with things and then opened to their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and saith unto them, thus it is written, thus it behooved Christ to suffer to rise from the dead the third day. He, he, Christ had to go through all that. He's not going to come as a conqueror right now. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. In Acts, after Christ has died, been buried, resurrected, and when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So they're still hung up on the kingdom. They're still thinking, okay, well, we, we, didn't, we didn't see the crucifixion coming or the burial, the resurrection. We didn't get all that. We get it now. Now we've gone through all of that. So, Lord, the, the kingdom's coming now, right? Forty days after he's risen from the dead. And they're thinking, okay, it's, it's time now. We've, we've, we get it. So you're going to restore it. They still couldn't see the, the 2,000 years or so, give or take some years. Lord, you're going to restore the kingdom now, right? And then he says this. He said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. You and I are not going to understand everything. There's a lot we don't know, a lot we won't know until we're with God forever. And then we'll sort it all out. He'll sort it all out for us. But in every one of these instances, this we're told, this we know, this we understand, that we're to be witnesses for him. Every time he brought it back to that. So there's a lot tonight. You might say, man, there's a lot of things I don't understand about my Bible. And Jesus didn't tell the disciples, well, you know, you need to go get a Bible college education and then go out. He corrected their misunderstanding he would, he would give them a brief little Bible course, if you will, and then say, go be a witness. Go be a witness. There's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know. But there's a lot we do know. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We know that. We have a message. We have a, a gospel that desperately needs to go out. There's a lot of confusing things about prophecy. There are a lot of things where you can read along and think, I'm not sure I'm following real well here. Say, well, one day when I get it all straightened out, then I'll go. You're never going to get it all straightened out. You're not going to. Not until we get to glory. The, the Bible tells us repeatedly there are a lot of things about God we can't understand. There are a lot of things that are deep. But the message every time is go be a witness, go be a witness, go be a witness. How, how many tracts do you give out in a week? How often do you invite somebody to church? How often are you looking for an opportunity to witness and share the gospel? You see, we can, we can get all, th oh, I, I need to get a better education. I need to get a better understanding. No, you just need to go. You just need to go. You find that all through the Bible, all through the demoniac of Gadara. Man, he, he, he hadn't been to Bible college. He hadn't even been to Sunday school yet. And he wants to go with Jesus. Jesus says, no, go home. Tell your family and friends what I've done for you. He's hardly a Bible scholar, but he knows this. He knows that Jesus changes lives. The blind man, a cast off, he wouldn't have even been permitted to come into the synagogue. And when he gets his eyes restored, 
He's confronted by the religious crowd. And, hey, wh- wh- who is this guy? And he says, I-, I don't really know, but I know this. One thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I can see. And when they come and they confront him more, and he says, well, you know, since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And they say to him, Was thou born in sin, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. But he knew this. And he hadn't been to Sunday school either. He said, I know I used to be blind, and now I can see. If you're a Christian tonight, you know that you used to be lost, and you've been found. You used to be spiritually blind, now you can see. You used to be on your way to hell, now you're on your way to heaven. You know some things. And the difference in your life wasn't you turned over a new leaf or you became religious. The difference in your life was you had an encounter with the living God. So go tell somebody. Go tell somebody. Pick up some tracks from the track rack and and go give them out. Don't wait. Well, you know, I I think I got to really study my Bible. I'm not discouraging study. We're all about it. We're, we're, We're in favor of education. We have a K through 12 school here. That's 13 years of education. And we've had people like it so much they stretch it out to 14 or 15 years. <laughs> and then there's, then there's four years of Bible college on top of that. Some people have made about a 20 year career out of that whole thing. So we're, we're good with education. But don't wait until you get educated to do something. For one thing, you don't know if the Lord's gonna come back in, in a month or two, you don't have time to get educated. The disciples are, well, Lord, are, the kingdom, no, 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 go, go, go be a witness, go be a witness. Can you imagine what would happen if the people of Lighthouse Baptist Church, members and regulars, just said, you know, we're gonna get serious about telling people in these dark days that there's hope, there's hope. They don't have to go on in despair and despondency. There's hope. So I know some of this stuff gets convoluted prophecy and history and some of the interweaving of things. Study, yeah. Don't get so obsessed with that that you forget your primary focus, your primary purpose is to be a light to this lost and dying world. You know some things already tonight. Go with what you know. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, I pray you'd use it. Challenge us. Lord, we're to represent you. We're your ambassadors. We're to be light in this world. God, help us be that this week. Help us live in light of eternity. Help us to look for opportunities to give out tracts and look for opportunities to be a witness and look for opportunities to share our faith and look for opportunities to invite people to church. Oh, God, help us. Help us to be children of the kingdom to come, excited about one day we'll have you rule and reign in righteousness. But until then, we're to represent you May we represent you well. Bless now this invitation we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.